there's a really interesting salamander that lives along the stream, and we're here today to see if we can find one. It's early March here in eastern Indiana, which means the salamander we're looking for should be out laying its eggs. Right. These are streamside salamander eggs. I don't see the mother around, but if we keep looking, I bet we can find an adult salamander. This fascinating little salamander is why we're here. Now the streamside salamander might not be flashy or brightly colored, but it is unique. It's kind of the oddball of its family. Like their relatives, streamside salamanders live in underground burrows, emerging only during the late winter to breed. But instead of moving to wetlands and ponds, most streamside salamanders breed in fast flowing, rocky streams. And unlike the wetlands and pools that most other mole salamanders are breeding in, these streams sometimes have predatory fish that could eat the larvae after they hatch. But streamside salamanders try to reduce this predation pressure by laying their eggs in smaller headwater streams where there are generally fewer and smaller fish. If they can survive a few short months after hatching, the babies will ultimately leave the water and head out for the safety of a small underground burrow or shelter nearby. And that could be the end of our story about this stream-dwelling salamander, but it turns out the streamside salamander might not be a valid species. So the sister species, which is just the most closely related species, uh, is the smallmouth salamander. And they're visually seemingly indistinguishable. Um, the smallmouth has a much wider, larger range. It spans pretty much the entire Midwest, all the way from Texas up to Ohio. Um, they were split into separate species in 1989 by biologists uh, Krauss and Petranka, um, and they sort of divided them up based mostly on morphology. Um, they noticed differences in the teeth, but also, and maybe more importantly, uh, ecologically and behaviorally. Uh, the stream sides seem to prefer using streams, hence the name, and they tend to lay eggs sort of singly uh, under rocks, and then the smallmouth tend to use vernal pools and lay them in clumps. Um, but Krauss and Petranka noted that it wasn't entirely consistent um, geographically or between those features, and that's sort of what we started to see too. What we tried to do with our research was to kind of delineate them more closely because it's been inconsistent and kind of fuzzy uh, differentiating between the two. And so we went into areas where they're likely to hybridize because their ranges overlap, and uh, where that contact zone is, where we expect the hybridization, as we moved away from that, we would expect to see more distinguishing traits. Uh, but when we looked into that, it got much trickier. When we bred stream sites and smallmouths in the same environment, we saw their behaviors that we see in the wild stay true in the lab. So stream sides laid larger eggs on the undersides of rocks, and they also went to plants once the bottoms of the rocks were filled up. Those eggs developed faster than smallmouth eggs. The larvae were larger initially, and the larvae developed to adulthood faster than smallmouth salamanders. And further, their pigmentation was darker as well. So all things that we see in the literature that are true for stream sides. Our results from the genomic analysis of the stream side and smallmouth salamanders didn't match the current species designations that we have of stream sides and smallmouths, but instead showed three groups. There was evidence of high levels of gene flow, high levels of admixture, right? There was no one clear group or two clear groups. So what is a species is a, is a very good question. There's no single definition of species. Uh, if you ask 50 biologists, you might get 50 different answers. Species is usually defined when it does three things. One, that it can't mate and produce viable offspring with other species. Two is that they're genetically distinct. So when we look at them genetically, there's not a ton of mixture. They're not coming up as the same thing, right? There's two distinct populations or two distinct things. And third is that they are just phenotypically different. So they act different, they look differently, and that they're on different evolutionary trajectories, which is hard to define. But there are other aspects to it, especially around conservation. So even if they're the same species, if they have very uh, unique evolutionary ecological traits and behaviors, uh, it may be important to preserve them. Uh, one, because they're unique in themselves, but also because having that type of geographic, uh, ecological and behavioral differences 
uh, makes diversity such that they're more resilient overall. What we ultimately decide to call these stream breeding salamander populations is kind of arbitrary, but it could have real conservation consequences. And if you take anything away from this video today, I hope it's a greater appreciation for the complexity and diversity of life and an understanding that conserving wildlife populations may not always be straightforward, but it's always worthwhile.